Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Gudi and this is Sachin Kulkarni. Hello. Uh, today's discussion is towards a few differences that we see in the Indian subcontinent and in the UK. So I'll be asking Sachin a few questions and he'll be reviewing the literature as well as his experience on what happens in the subcontinent regarding uh, certain aspects of fertility and how it, we differ from the European and the American data. So in simple terms, Sachin, what is different? I think the, uh, the kind of characteristics of our patients uh, hormonally is a bit different when it comes to our population. To give an example, uh, like we see a PCOS very common in our subcontinent and we do have a hyper LH polycystic ovary pretty common. And what the literature says is uh, uh, that though the metaphase 2 oocytes are the same that obtained in a PCOS lady in the Indian population and that of a Caucasian race, the fertilization rate is a little lower, the pregnancy, clinical pregnancy rates still are lower. And also the literature is also focused that the subcontinent women have 3.5 times more chances of miscarriages after IVF. So that's also pretty uh, common there. And most important is the metabolic syndrome. And once we have uh, subcontinent women having metabolic syndrome for a real long time, stretching over a decade, definitely they will have their systemic influences. Uh, uh, where I want to bring this up again is uh, uh, that's quite a damning data which says it's uh, 3.5 times more miscarriages. And now, uh, where do you get that evidence from and what do you think is a causative factor in that case? I think this is uh, this was from a SWAN study uh, which was published across the uh, nations and uh, it, it basically, I feel it's more to do with the kind of oocyte quality. It could be uh, epigenetic uh, problems or could be because of the pollution, the kind of environment, the more kind of pelvic infections we are exposed to. Or uh, it's also one of the studies talks about the kind of FSH polymorphism the subcontinent women have. And they say these women would have a different polymorphism. And because of that, uh, the estrogen level during the course of stimulation go up very high. And that would cause a little more asynchrony in the endometrium. So all these things contribute in their own fashion uh, uh, to uh, this miscarriage rate. Uh, that still continues to worry me because uh, uh, it does is also reflected in natural conception of natural miscarriages because that that I can't see if the same link is occurring, which means that do uh, uh, women in the subcontinent have a higher miscarriage rate in nature than the rest of the world? Yeah, I think that's true because and, and uh, let me let me just quote there on the Amigov study. Let's go to the P Diamond study, and the secondary analysis of the Amigov study uh, says that they are basically questioned why letrozole has a low pregnancy rate in unexplained infertility compared to gonadotrophins. And, and interestingly, in the secondary analysis they detected, the low socioeconomic group patients had more miscarriages and less chances of pregnancy with IUI. And they said the low socioeconomic group, which exists so much big in subcontinent, is related to a chronic level of stress. And accumulated chronic stress, economic stress, would cause a decrease in the GNRH diet. And because of a decrease in GNRH type, a simple letrozole stimulation cannot have a good effect in getting more pregnancies in subcontinent. So, so low socioeconomic group in the Amigov study had a miscarriage rate of about 26% compared to just 11% of the upper socioeconomic criteria. So it is to do with a long-term stressful chronic stress, accumulated chronic stress or the socioeconomic stress. And the long-term stress, whatever endocrine or metabolic parameters are changed because of that, that probably even after achieving pregnancy cannot correct it and hence the chances of miscarriages are high. I think this secondary analysis of Amigov study is really focused a lot and that uh, makes a certain change we need to put in practice in subcontinent rather than just giving a prescription of ovulation induction medicine. We should be more taking interest in if we can decrease the chronic stress in the family and probably that will give a better life birth in a long term reason. Uh, other question which I want to ask is, uh, again, what uh, do women in the subcontinent have a lower ovarian reserve and how does that have an impact on your uh, IVF and stimulation protocols? Yeah. Uh, firstly, I would like to quote two things here. One is 2016, there was a social data which was published and which said that 12% of the Indian women have menopause by the time they reach 40 years. This was a data published from Bangalore and they had scanned more than about 22,000 women there. And that's very alarming. So if we consider about 12 years before that, so right from 28 years, we do have a very exponentially decreasing ovarian reserve in India. And most of our urban women will get married by 28 and 30 
and they would like to work and be independent and they get, then get married. So by the time they reach us with infertility, they already are candidates of low ovarian reserve. That's one. The second is that an interesting study which has done a comparison between the Spanish women and the Indian women done by Dr. Manish Pankar et al. And this was published in Fertility Sterility sometime I think 2015. And the study clearly states that Indian women ovary are six years earlier, they age, age six years earlier than that of the Spanish women. So this is the kind of environment, probably the genes and the fertilizers or pollution, whatever they are, or the stress, all this contribute to a decreased ovarian reserve so preponderantly in our patient groups. Uh, my next question is, uh, uh, you have been one of the uh, researchers who looked at the Indian PCO phenotype and we, I think we are having this going in for publications uh, in the next few weeks and looking at your work and looking at the data, what do you think is different in the Indian PCOS compared to the PCOS we see here? Uh, we see basically two kinds of PCOS in India. We do see uh, because of low socioeconomic status in the rural India, they don't get uh, enough fat proportion and they get late menarche and then they develop polycystic ovary and they present to us as thin lean polycystic ovaries and they could be quite hyperandrogenic. The second is the one who are urban polycystic ovaries, they, the childhood obesity, uh, they get their fat proportion, they get an early menarche and the height is stunted but they grow fat very fast and they can develop their metabolic syndrome pretty early. But what comparative literature says that uh, even if we compare to the studies of Vajranayaka et al. from Sri Lanka, she says that the metabolic syndrome is much higher in our population. So if somebody asks me one question, uh, what is more common, polycystic ovary or metabolic syndrome? I think it's the metabolic syndrome which is very common and that's what we gynecologists need to learn more about, managing the metabolic syndrome and improving the fertility outcomes. And secondly is the LH. The hyper-LH polycystic ovary I feel we see more commonly compared to the Caucasian Yes. So, uh, you know, I have a very simple way of looking at things and saying that your cycles are irregular, irrespective of what your blood test would say in terms of insulin resistance, there is a certain amount of insulin resistance. Absolutely. Happening. So, my second question which comes up, which is very controversial, is do you give metformin to your women during IVF or before IVF? Uh, and uh, Which is again, in research, has not been proved to be uh, work very well, but look at it from the endocrinology point of view. And yes, it does lower insulin res resistance. So what are your thoughts about it? Uh, I, I would love to invite criticism on this, but I think we should use metformin in subcontinent and very liberally. I would go, I would prefer all my patients or PCOs going on to metformin because it will correct the metabolic parameters. Uh, may not correct the endocrine parameters, but metabolic parameters certainly. And that will give me benefit in my live birth rate chasing, decreasing my GDMs later, decreasing my IUGRs and placental insufficiency. After all, we are not chasing just a positive pregnancy test. We are chasing a live birth rate. So I think uh, making change in the metabolic syndrome parameters is extremely important in the support My last question is, is uh, there is this huge discussion that goes on and I think we, uh, during the last four days of teaching, uh, one of the things which we found very difficult to convince people who come from the subcontinent is that they are reluctant to use HMG compared to uh, recombinant uh -huh. FSH. And while we are moving closer to using H H more and more HMG, why is it that there's such reluctance to use uh, uh, re uh, HMG and not uh, and give up on uh, recombinant at times. And w why is it that uh, there's it, people don't discuss this and say, well, they are both very much the same, and the use can vary from psych from person to person. And I agree, we can give different drugs at different times, uh, but essentially both tend to do the same. Yeah. I think uh, as a young consultant back in uh, subcontinent, you get exposed to suddenly a sea of HMG molecules which are available to. Uh, preparations which are available to you and not everything is quality control or, or the batch to batch variability is so high that it's a natural tendency to shift some to some drug which has a consistent batch to batch variability and that's why probably something like a recombinant preparation is more preferred but uh, the consultant does understand over a period of time that using recombinant alone is not adequate and one has to either add an HMG or to go uh, for a good HMG preparation in a right dose and probably that definitely has a long-term better effects. And as uh, all the studies in the Western world have talked about the uh, urinary highly purified HMG 
is better from the low miscarriage rate and better pregnancy rate and better life birth. Slowly, even in the India, I'm sure people are getting convinced about using more amount of this kind of HMGs in their practice than just relying on only the recombinant type of such thing. And the, and the last thing, you know, which uh, I will ask you is, I think it's, it's happening all across the world uh, that we have started the use of PRP. Ah. Uh, and uh, I think it must be happening in India too and I think it becomes a last hope right from injecting the ovary to the endometrium. Uh, the evidence lacking, where do you stand on this? I think uh, it's always you know that the evidence comes later and the practicing consultant goes ahead. It's like a tortoise and a rabbit. You just keep practicing whatever newly comes and which, is, which doesn't have much amount of side effect, you feel very freely to practice. And the way the clinic markets itself by doing so many procedures and that, that, that all alters the whole uh, phasing of the consultants getting lured towards these procedures. But let me go a little bit of detail. Uh, when we see patients of repeated implantation failure, I've seen consultants using uh, GCSF, HCG washers, PRPs, bone marrow stem cells and you know, so many kinds of endometrial scratch and so many things there to improve the implantation rate. But what we're missing is on incidence, what is the true incidence of chronic endometritis in our community. And chronic endometritis is very easily spoken about, very, everybody thinks, well, I understand what is chronic endometritis, but not every chronic endometritis is tuberculosis. So chronic endometritis has a very syndromic diagnosis. So clinically, there should be a little tender mobility of the cervix, congestion of the cervix, or unexpected sudden bleeding when you put an IUR catheter inside. You must do a hysteroscopy to see stromal edema, strawberry patterns, micro polyps, and most important, you must take a biopsy and subject it for a CD138 labeled plasma cell. And if in 10 high power field, if you can identify one CD138 labeled plasma cell, that is then diagnostic of chronic endometritis. Now that is very infrequently done test in India. And such an easy test, like in Kolhapur, I can do it for just 1500 rupees, rather than doing the expensive tests, other things and other interventions. And then, if you have that positive, it's better to take a endometrial sample for culture sensitivity and how I do it is I just take a sterile IUI catheter, go smoothly into the endometrial cavity, just rub it a bit, take it out and with the sterile scissor cut the tip of the catheter and subject it for the culture sensitivity. The report comes as gram positive, cocci or negative cocci, whatever the report and there are nice guidelines placed what drug you will be giving. You can give an augmentin, you can give doxycycline, metronidazole or you can give ciprofloxacillin. And what studies say that you should be doing a repeat biopsy and again doing a CD138. And you should do it three times and repeated courses of antibiotics and that would be the treatment. So we don't investigate our patient for chronic endometritis. We are not giving a complete treatment of chronic endometritis, but we are using all our other measures like PRPs and GCSF to improve the implantation rate. I think that could be one of the missing links back in India. Okay. Thank you very much, Sachin. I think it's a, a pleasure. great four days of teaching. Thank you.